Hello and welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. We're also joined by the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this is Wednesday, April 21st, and we are uh, taking testimony this morning on S13, an act related to the, impl the implementation of the pupil waiting uh, factors report. And we're first going to hear from our um, educational associations, and I'd like to start with um, Jeff Fannin of the NEA to hear your testimony on S, we're, we're looking at S13, language in S13. So Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, both committees and both committee chairs. Good to see everybody um, <clears throat> with a steady uh, internet feed, let's hope. Um, so once again, Jeff Fannin from Vermont NEA, Thank you very much for giving me a few minutes to talk with you today about S13, uh, the waiting study as I know it, uh, the waiting legislative task force. Um, certainly Vermont NEA very much supports getting the weights right uh, and correctly established to offer, consistent with the Brigham decision, an equitable opportunity to a public education. I'll make a few uh, brief points in support of the bill. Uh, as you just mentioned, Madam Chair, poverty <clears throat> is a key factor. And uh, we believe that you must truly account for those children growing up in poverty. And that includes providing appropriate financial supports for such students. Um, the resources need to be directed to account for poverty. The UVM study supports this. And likewise, the other recommendations from the UVM study should be implemented. As well, just briefly, um, the rurality, as it was noted as, uh, also is a, a critical factor. And it may sometimes go with, hand in hand with poverty, but not necessarily, it's not an absolute. So the rural nature of schools also uh, plays a factor in this. Uh, the study also talks about a new factor related to trauma. And Vermont NEA held a conference in May of 2019 um, about on this very issue and more than 200 education stakeholders attended. And everybody agreed there, I think in general terms that uh, students suffering from trauma need more resources and the need is growing. In fact, recently the post-pandemic um, need is gonna be greater. Some mental health experts are saying upwards of 30% of students returning in the fall, this fall, uh, will have suffered some form of trauma during the pandemic year, 30%. And that's a, that's a incredibly high number. And we just wanna to, want to put that out there for you to think about um, a little bit as you, we proceed here. Uh, S13's mention of Act 173 is also important. Connecting Act 173 from uh, 2018, uh, I think it was 2018, geez, I'm getting around my dates here. Um, and the task force is critical because when fully implemented, Act 173 will fundamentally change how special education and all education services are delivered by reimbursing schools based on upon a, based upon a block grant for students a need, uh, which also affects the waiting discussion. And let me be clear, Act 173 is far from full, fully implemented as the bill required educators to get trained in how to change their education practices to better serve all students. And that training has not yet happened. Uh, as we discuss the weights in 173, we also should be cognizant of Act 173's PD, this professional development void that must be addressed, addressed before schools convert to the block grant. <clears throat> and finally, the waiting study implicates the Tax Structure Commission's recommendation to abolish the residential property tax to fund education. And it's great to have the, the Ways and Means Committee here today. Uh, the commission recommends funding education through the income tax for residents. As such, changing the funding via the weights should likely be done in concert with the change to an income tax with which to fund education. Uh, they go hand in hand. So S113, therefore, should be amended to add some specific mention of the tax, commission, tax structure commission's recommendation uh, about converting to the income tax to pay for education. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. We support S113 to be clear. We think it, you know, some slight modifications might be helpful, but um, with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Just a reminder, it's S13. <laughs> what did I say? I'm <laughs> S13. Um, Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. I noticed that you mentioned adding resources and I just wanted to, to just clarify I think we're, the committee is definitely looking at the interplay between uh, taxpayer equity 
spending resources and outcomes, which are not necessarily addressed directly by this, that there's still some question. Do you, would you agree that, that there's a, a somewhat, we don't know how behavior will change yet. No, but I think that certainly we know that, um, you know, the poverty issue is real and, 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 you know, it's been around in my entire tenure that we've talked about the, the nature of poverty and, and the insidious nature of poverty on students and getting education. So schools are being asked to do a lot more than they were, frankly, when I was in school a long, long time ago. Um, and that's partly related to poverty and, and how we need to address it. So resources for that specific need are, are real and it might uh, help with outcomes. It might help with other things, um, taxpayer equity as well. Um, thank you, Representative Maslin. Thanks. Um, Jeff, quick question. How is the 30% kids likely experienced trauma during the pandemic arrived at? Um, you know, I, I got that from Dave Melnick at NFI. I'd have to ask him, I don't know specifically, but they're, they're working with schools right now a lot of, and, and uh, they're just estimating that a lot of kids have suffered some you know, pretty severe forms of trauma throughout the year. It's been a tough year for, for students working at home, in a lot of cases, you know, zooming in. It's not been a great year for a lot of kids. Some kids have done, some kids to be honest, have done better in the Zoom environment or the remote environment. But uh, I think a lot of kids have not done so well. And a lot of kids are in, you know, frankly, schools are the safest place for a lot of kids. And, um, and we know that. And so if they're not in a safe place all the time, they're exposed to other traumas and other issues that uh, are gonna show up in the school's doorstep. Um, thanks, if there's any more specifics that come up from time to time, I'd like to hear about them, thanks. On the trauma issue? Um, determinations, factors, um, things that play in, things that work, things that don't. Thank you. That's all for now. Thank you. Representative Till. Yeah, thank you. In, in response to that, you know, we've I've done a little bit of work on um, adverse childhood experience over the years. And um, we know our baseline rate is about 14% in kids. So statewide, 14%. And it's higher in various subgroups. So with the, the pandemic and what we've seen nationally, it's not the least bit surprising that we would be up to 30%. Sadly, I think you're, you're right, Representative Till. Representative Kornheiser. The Ways and Means Party over here in House Head. Um, Jeff, are you saying that one thing I've been wrestling with is this idea of differentiating the things um, that poverty often results in um, or that are correlated with poverty like ACEs and then the actual you know, experience of kids such as ACEs. And so I'm wondering if you are asking us to pull that apart a little bit better or if you're just reflecting specifically on the pandemic and the experience of the pandemic and how we have to bring those into this conversation. Well, the... the the study talked about trauma generally, I think, and, and accounting for it in some way. So I think that's what the task force would, would have a discussion about. Um, I, I'm just reminding folks that we are in the middle of a pandemic. We're coming out. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not coming at us. It's not a train coming at us, uh, which is good. But we're still in it and trying to get out of it. And when kids arrive fully and, you know, I, I say back in the fall, fully you know, back to normal, if you will, a normal school environment next fall. Um, I think we just need to be aware that a lot of kids will have had a rough year. I'll say that. And this task force uh, that's included in S13, um, I think should look at trauma just generally. And I think that's what the, the study talks about. Thank you. The, the main focus of for our, our interest today is in getting recommendations for that task force. What questions do we want to put before the task force that are going to help us um, move forward? Um, Representative Odie. Thank you. So um, when students are not in school over the summer, um, if the for children who are in poverty, would it would it be helpful if the 
waiting were to change, if there were more resources for them than to be in a safe place in July and August? If I understand correctly your question, Representative Vody, um, I think the answer is yes. We support robust summer programs and, and have. I think they're important. I, I think the real challenge this year, frankly, is going to be uh, educators are pretty tired. I met with, you know, Jay uh, invited me to meet with some principals the other day, and I asked him at the end, uh, after talking with a group of new principals, how you doing? And to a T, I think they're all saying they're tired. And I think that that is true from superintendents, principals, educators in, in the buildings. Everybody's pretty tired. So um, Representative Vody, I think, yes, we support robust summer programs. I think this summer might be a challenge to get people to do that work. I mean, they need a break. They're tired. I talked to two teachers yesterday and they were just, I was asking them to do something and, and they're like, I need a few weeks after the school year. And so we'll just have to schedule a little bit later in July, but it is, um, people are tired and summer is a time when people typically recharge their batteries. And uh, if we're just gonna keep school going, it's not a really a recharge. I think it's, um, so I think a robust play-based summer program is the way to go. Get kids out of, out of their environment if it's unsafe into a safer school-like environment, I'll say that. And we did uh, recently appropriate, I think it was, it was several million, maybe 4 million, I think, that has gone to after school. And that is a requirement of ESSER, the local funds going to ESSER. And again, just to remind everybody that those numbers, the allocations to the different school districts are based on Title I. So the money will be available. Um, and, and after school is not just looking at academic programs. It's looking for those other programs that, that uh, yeah, I, I absolutely did not mean to say that I thought that teachers would be teaching over the summer. I'm I'm talking about what um, Mr. Fannin said at the very end of what he said, which is, uh, you know, a play-based nurturing environment for children over the summer, which could happen with, um, with more resources available. Um, and then, oh, a second comment is, I don't think I understand the focus now during this conversation on outcomes when that is not a focus under the current funding formula. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I raised the issue, but I, I understand that we, you know, outcomes are a part of the equation. We want to make sure that kids are getting educated. That's that's what we're about in, in some large measure. So if, if it's um, something we need to measure, then that's good. I think you're right though, this bill is about how we resource properly for students and, and their, their needs and schools needs. I'm gonna um, do one more question from Representative James and then I'd like to move on to our next witness. So, and I'm su assuming Representative Maslin, that, that is what we would call an old hand, not a new hand. Okay. Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb. And um, Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I wanted to hear just a little bit more, if you don't mind. Um, I guess I've been coming from a starting place of wanting to narrow the scope of the task force um, and have them focus on implementation of the weights. And I, I understand, um, I think, about why you feel it's important that they also consider Act 173, but I, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about that. Um, and in particular, though, um, the larger <clears throat> question of the Tax Structure Commission and how we fund sort of our entire education system and the shift to an income-based um, you know, context that one seems like a bigger question to me. And I, I wonder why you feel that's, that should be part of the task force's scope as well. I'm gonna interrupt you. for one second, just to let you know that uh, Megan Roy will be coming in later and she will be, be speaking specifically to the census-based funding uh, group issues related to uh, waiting. Thanks, so we'll, we'll I, yeah, her, I as well. her testimony. Yeah, but go ahead, Jeff. So I, right, it's a, it's a good question, Representative James. I think the answer, for me at least, and Megan may have a different one later, 
I also serve in that, that advisory group. Um, so there are many opinions, I'm sure, on that. But uh, as we change the weights, we're also talking about changing how we fund for, for you know, under 173 to a block grant. And I, I, if the task force is going to look at how we resource, I think, we, I think it's necessarily uh, appropriate for them to look at both. If we're, we haven't fully implemented 173, uh, so let's look at it while we're doing the waiting discussion as well. I think we can, I think we can do two things at once. And as well, um, if we're the recommendation of the tax structure commission is we ought to be looking at um, funding education through the income tax for residents and abolishing the property tax. Um, then I think we ought to, you know, incorporate that into the conversation as well. We're talking about how we fund schools. And I think they, they're all interrelated. So to just look at one and then change others without incorporating that in the conversation doesn't seem very uh, healthy to me, if you will, to the overall system. We might get something right and wrong in one way and, and just do the complete reverse in something else. Well, also, I know that our committee, there are members of our committee that have not really seen what the census-based funding changes to see what that is. And I, I will get some testimony so people understand what, what we're talking about in relation to you know, the funds going up in one district and down in another. It's a zero sum game. Um, thank you very much, Jeff Fannin. And you're going to stick around as long as you can. Um, I, I actually have to hop and I apologize. I will be back if I can. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Jay Nichols, Principals Association. Come back. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm really impressed that uh, Chair Ansel was able to get her whole committee into the room too, such a small health ed room, very nice job. Um, for the record, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. Um, I've testified uh, on people waiting UVM study a number of times. I'm gonna try to keep my comments focused on provisions of S13 today, the act relating to the implementation of the waiting study or the waiting report. Um, section one, findings. Uh, and I'm using the word I a lot. I usually use the word we, uh, and I'm using I because this testimony is really from me based on conversations with a lot of principals, but it's not, it's not coming from, uh, you know, a formal meeting of, the, of our executive council or anything like that. So I agree with the findings. I support the new cost factors and weights as outlined in the report. I also agree that the current weightings have no real basis in any statistically valid way. Um, I don't know where they came from. They've been there as long as I've been around. And I don't have a problem with a phased approach to revisiting uh, or revising the weighting formula. In fact, I think, I think you're gonna have to do that. In terms of uh, section two, the task force, I fully support this being a legislative task force. I think that's the most appropriate group that should be doing this work at this time. I think the task force needs to focus on the implementation of the pupil weighting factors report. It should not be, in my opinion, a rehash of the report or the validity of the results of the report. I support the task force recommending to the General Assembly an action plan and proposed legislation. Uh, and in terms of the listed responsibilities, I know we're supposed to respond to that. So. First, I don't think the task force should touch the weights themselves. That work was done in a comprehensive, cohesive manner by uh, Professor Colby and her team, including some national experts. And I, I think to touch any part of that, you're kind of messing with the whole thing. In terms of categorical aid, I think you implement the weights themselves uh, before you look at any other aid. And I really don't mean any other aid, but in terms of categorical aid, and I think the reason you do that is we need to see what this is gonna do at least mock it out a little bit for a couple of years and take a good look at it. In terms of uh, the third one, I think this is very important. Extra spending capacity should be used on supporting students and school districts that have been historically underfunded. Not additional tax uh, rate breaks for local citizens. That shouldn't be the purpose. If the idea is that students have not received the resources in the past that they should have received, then we need to try to mitigate that concern. Uh, in terms of the Vermont Tax uh, Structure Commission report, I don't really think the tax and capacity and educational property tax rate, rate recommendations impact on that. Whether you switch to an income-based funding system or you stay with the current system or some hybrid of the two, I don't think that should, will change the pupil weighting mechanism. That will change how you raise the revenue to provide the resources that are budgeted by local districts. Uh, number five, I fully support the goal of promoting equity and easing the financial impact during the transition. 
from our current weighting system to the more statistically valid system outlined in the UVM study. Six, I agree with a look into adjustments for non-operating school districts and CTEs. I just don't know enough about non-operating school districts to know what the impact might be. So I think that is worth some extra study. Seven, I see no reason to study funding formulas in other states. Um, other states are constantly looking at our funding formula. Uh, and I think this work's already been done. Uh, number eight, maybe the most important for me at this time, regardless of what happens with Act 173, I think the weights uh, should take place. However, what we really need to consider in this process and this commission we need to consider is the maintenance of effort provisions that are in federal law in relationship to special ed funding. So there are federal requirements related to the amount of money we spend in the state and in school districts for certain purposes. Uh, essentially, with a few exceptions, we need to spend the same amount of money or more or we risk uh, the, the possibility of losing some federal funds. Now there's ways around this, but we're gonna need people with important financial expertise so that if a district is going to receive less money in census-based funding from 173 and also receive uh, less funding through their local property tax or whatever mechanism we're using, we just need to make sure that we're not missing that maintenance of effort number. Uh, number nine, whatever is implemented needs to be consistent with Act 60 and 68 and meet the constitutional requirements of the Brigham decision. In terms of a consultant, D, I think that makes sense. Uh, again, as long as the focus is on implementation and not essentially trying to do another study or change recommendations in a waiting study, that's already been done. In terms of collaboration, E, we will collaborate obviously with the task force any way that we can. Section three talks about additional legislative action. Uh, we agree that legislation needs to be passed that implements changes to make sure all students have equitable access to educational opportunities. And uh, finally, section four, the approps. Uh, I'm no expert in this area, but I would think an implement, uh, implementation plan, uh, and kind of like Representative Tooth, I'm a Franklin County fiscal conservative boy, you know, um, I think it's a lot of money if you're just looking for somebody to consult implementing the plan. On the other side of that, though, if you're really looking at redoing the whole thing and this is, and you're just going to kind of almost redo the UVM study and make it even broader, then I think 150000 is not, not going to cut it. You're going to have to add more money for that. Um, so I would respectfully submit that if you focus on implementing plan, you probably get more than enough money. If you're focused on making a bunch of changes to the education system as part of this, then I think you're going to need a lot more money. And that's it. Other uh, subject to questions. Thank you. Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how, uh, let's say the um, weighting study is implemented, weights are changed, how do we measure scientifically, how do we measure that that action actually had the outcomes of increasing educational opportunities for uh, students in poverty, ELL students. How do we measure that, that those populations increased in their access uh, to education and, and were successful? So it's, it's gonna be over time, but there are certain metrics that we can look at. There are things like graduation rates, uh, how, how often students in certain groups end up going to college, how often students in those same groups end up going in co to college in comparison to similar groups in other states that don't have a equal opportunity funding mechanism in place. So there's a lot of metrics you can look at. You also can look at things like assessment, things like SBAC, even though I don't put a lot of stock in um, standardized assessments, they are one tool that you can look at. So there's a lot of things like that that we can look at and see are more of these students um, closing the gap between them and students of other that have had uh, more advantage. Now there's statistical um, correlation between how well a student does and the funding system of their school, regardless of whether the student lives in poverty or not. So for example, if a student lives in poverty in Essex where I used to be superintendent, they are surrounded by a lot more opportunities oftentimes than a student who lives in poverty that may live in the Northeast Kingdom. And so because of that, they, they may get extra supports through that system that ha happens to be in place in the school. So we see across the country, students in poverty that are in well-financed um, educational systems do much better than students of the same poverty level in a system that it has more poverty within the system. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. It's a tough one. 
Uh, you muted yourself, Representative Austin. I saw that study and it's interesting to me that the neighborhoods that children also grow up have a huge influence. Um, so uh, thanks for referring to that. Thank you. Representative Dorothy. Thank you, good morning. Uh, Jay, I, I've been thinking about um, uh, the suggestion that districts be essentially required to use any new spending capacity that they might gain through changes in the weights. And just from your perspective, what would that, how would that be accomplished? What, have you any thoughts on that? So that's why I'm really happy that it's a legislative task force that doesn't name the VPA to it. Um, I don't have a magical answer to that. I think you're gonna have to look at some type of mechanism that shows the previous uh, per pupil equalized spending in a district compared to what the equalized spending per student is, you know, in the following year when there's a higher tax rate. And I don't know, this is going to be a Brad James uh, question along with uh, Dr. Colby. And I'm not even sure if you're going to be able to get at it legislatively. We may have to get at it as much through the court of public opinion as anything else. And I don't have a solid answer for that. And I apologize for that, Representative Turfey. No, that's okay. Um, I I, I don't know that there is a good answer for it, but um, that's why I'm just shopping around for, for other thoughts, so thanks. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Conlon, and then we'll, we'll move on to um, Susiklowski. Uh, thanks, and, and actually following up on that question, uh, Jay, could you comment a bit about, um, in terms of enforcing the idea that, okay, you have extra taxing capacity now, do you wanna see that translate into student outcomes or student opportunity? Um, the use of a kind of maybe, I call it more robust enforcement of um, educational quality standards or even the old school public school approval standards? Yeah, I think going through a regulatory frame is a very good idea, Representative Conlon. And it may be something that we, we work at through the state board uh, and maybe just, uh, and also with support from the AOE, I think that's a really, a really good idea. One of the advantages of the old PSA standards was, you know, you could say to your school board, listen, the pipes are leaking in the boys' locker room. Here it is right here. We have to do this or we're going to be dinged by the state. Um, that is one of the advantages of it. And so I do think going at it through a regulatory lens may be better than going at it through a legislative lens. Although if the legislature could offer some cover or support, I think that would carry a lot of weight. Thanks. Thank you. I am going to, given the time, we're going to go have Sue Siglowski go and then Jeff Francis, and then I'll open to questions. So we'll hear from both of them before uh, questions. So welcome, Sue Siglowski from the School Boards Association. Good morning, Sue Siglowski, uh, Executive Director of the Vermont School Boards Association. I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to testify on S13 relating to implementation of the pupil weighting factors report. Uh, as stated in its executive summary, the report stems from concerns about the extent to which the existing funding formula is effective in equalizing educational costs and by extension opportunities to learn for students across the state. The VSBA's resolution addressing equalization clearly states that it is the duty of the state of Vermont to ensure fiscal equity for all school districts to allow equal educational opportunities for all students. I would like to reemphasize two points that I provided in testimony to the House Education Committee in February. The first one is that the VSBA fully supports the findings as presented in the report. And the second is that the VSBA supports the establishment of a thoughtful and expeditious implementation plan in pursuit of equity of opportunities for all students and one that is designed to build capacity within the systems to absorb the changes in funding due to changes in weights. S13's formation of a task force on implementation of the pupil weighting factors report is a step in the right direction as long as the task force stays focused on implementation. We do have concerns about assigning duties um, to the task force that go beyond developing a plan to implement the report. Broad topics such as consideration of funding formulas in other states 
and alternative models for school funding go beyond implementation of the report. It is questionable whether a task force that is constrained to meeting 12 times can do this, these broad topics justice in addition to all of the other duties listed in the bill. And it also leaves open the possibility that the task force will not develop a plan for implementation of the weights. Therefore, VSBA supports narrowing the scope of the duties of the task force so that it is clear that the task force is charged with creating a plan to implement the weights. Additionally, S13 currently requires the task force to hold one or more public meetings to share information and receive input from the public concerning its work. Because the implementation of the report is a very important statewide issue, it is unlikely that one meeting will be sufficient for public input. We encourage the committees to consider adding more opportunities for public input in geographically diverse areas of the state. On the topic of the excess spending threshold, the VSBA supports a suspension of the excess spending threshold to assist districts that need immediate relief while the task force creates a plan to implement the report. Um, this, the excess spending threshold is not currently addressed um, in S13. And finally, the pupil weighting simulator in the report needs to be updated with the most current data available and to reflect the Act 46 mergers. In order to create a thoughtful implementation plan, the task force should have access to data which reflects the changes districts are likely to experience when the pupil weights are updated. S13 should include a requirement to update the simulator so that the task force has the data it needs to create a thoughtful implementation plan. Uh, that concludes my testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions, thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll go right to Jeff Fritz. Oh, do you, do you want, would you want to go to Representative Ansel? I would never want to interfere with you. So why don't you go ahead? Right, just, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned the simulator in the report. And I wonder if you can tell me whether the simulator takes into account ESSER funding. I don't believe that. The current simulator takes that into account because it was created um, before the pandemic. Well, we, we've had ESSER for a long time. Um, my, uh, so the, it's increased a whole lot um, recently, but, um, but it's been there for a long time. So there's federal funding that focuses on poverty. And my question is, because you mentioned the simulator and that we should use it and update it, um, whether the simulator takes into account any of those federal funds directed to poverty. I think that would be a good question for Professor Colby, um, the author of the report. Um, yes. yeah. I, yeah, I would direct that to her. Um, I think that, you know, since since the, the simulator was developed, there certainly has been some time that has gone by. So um, it definitely needs to be updated uh, just to reflect um, more current information. I think that's, that's actually something that we might want to consider to make sure that that is considered since we have these, these three years of funds. Representative Austin, would you mind if we waited until we did, until we heard from, um, from this, the superintendents? Yeah. I, just, I just want to say that I think Brad James has created a simulator. Um, I think he presented it to us, so that might be something to look at. Um, yes, and, and I think the question is perhaps to look at adding in the ESSER funding as well into the simulator. So, um, Jeff Francis from the from Mount Superintendents Association. Good morning, <clears throat> Jeffrey Francis from Mount Superintendents Association. How is my audio working this morning? It's so excellent. Okay, great. Well, I hope it stays that way. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, Jay Nichols and Sue Siglowski and I often collaborate on testimony. We did not in the case of S13, but my comments are similar to theirs, so I'll be brief. Um, equity, may it's the underpinning of the education funding system in Vermont, and the determination was made that the weights needed to be changed. I think that the study um, was carefully vetted. Uh, Tammy Colby and 
Secretary French, I thought gave some of the most informative testimony on the topic that I'd heard uh, in conjunction with one another last week. Um, and I, th I think that it's well established that the weight should change um, in order to maintain equity in our funding system. I think the method by which that happens um, is what you're working on. And the question is, is changing the weights an eventuality or not? And S13 sets up a process for uh, consideration of an array of factors and there's language within the bill that indicates that there'll be an implementation plan for the weights and then the various um, aspects that the legislative study committee and I supported as a legislative study committee are asked to examine sort of broaden the focus and narrow the focus. And I understand that in the house you're trying to get that right. Um, and I think that's what you ought to be doing. So um, one, job that VSA has is to sort of help superintendents who have a keen interest in equity and management understand what is coming. So because of the pandemic, there's been sort of a long lead into this process and we're eager to help you um, to the extent that you'd invite us to get sort of the scope of the study right. Um, I thought that Jay Nichols points were good with regard to what the study should focus on. And I think that a fundamental question that you're gonna ask is, is this a process that's gonna to lead to um, an adjustment of the weights or are we gonna sort of broaden the area of study and focus into considerations um, that are reflected in certain elements of the, of the charge to the task force. So I'm gonna quickly run through those and then I'll often I'll stop also and respond to questions. Um, so, with regard to number one, which is a recommendation on which weighting factors to modify or create, um, in my opinion, based on my review of the study, that's work that was done in the study itself. So I think that the charge number one is redundant with the study. Um, on the question of uh, categorical aid um, in the context of weighting factors, that, that's really thorny policy. Um, and I believe that I agree with Jay Nichols that the, um, that the presumption should be that the weights are gonna change and then use that as the basis for considering um, what else could happen with categorical aid. Um, recommendation number three, um, talks about how to ensure that school districts are using funding to meet education quality standards. I think that's perfectly appropriate for the task force to look at, but it's not something that's necessarily evaluated now. So number three, in my opinion, raises the question of, well, we're gonna modify the system and now we're gonna create sort of a, re a review to make sure that money's being invested the way it should be invested. I wouldn't say that that's not useful or appropriate, but that's not a feature of our system currently in the broadest terms. And you've already talked about education quality standards per se. So I think it's, that is appropriate within the parameters of sort of uh, appropriateness given the, you, you wouldn't want to create a, if any new standards along those lines are created, they ought to be for everybody and not just the perceived beneficiaries of, the, of, of a change in, in policy. Um, four, um, which has to do with the Vermont Tax Structure Commission report, I think is, um, it's an appropriate reference, but it's a huge body of work unto itself. And in my entire career, every year there's discussion of possible changes to the education funding system um, in total. I don't think that the consideration of the weights is, is that. I think that the weights is a very specific piece of education policy that's intended to address perceived inequ or real inequities as they currently exist. So I think that the action on the weights um, should precede the more comprehensive work. Um, five, uh, extremely important. So because of the pandemic, um, 
school districts are contending with whatever it is they're confronted on a daily basis. And I think that while there's a lot of theoretical discussion around the implications of changes to the waiting system, um, I don't believe that the practical realities have set in for school districts yet in either direction, quite frankly. So one function that the um, legislative task force can perform is to make sure as it conducts its work that everybody knows what's coming because the last thing we would wanna see is uh, um, implementation of the weights and then people sort of awakened to the fact that um, they have dramatic implications with regard to their own budgetary processes that you don't want that. Um, uh, consideration of school funding formulas and other states and alternative models for funding. I'm not certain that that's purposeful with respect to the focus of the work. Um, uh, rec consider the relationship between recommended wage or categorical aid and changes to special education. The, 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 the um, interconnectivity between 173 and the weights is something that needs to be well understood and responded to. So yes, um, nine I think goes without saying because underlying law is uh, Act 60 um, and Act 46. I don't have a comment on the consultant, although it does seem to me that one is necessary. Um, with regard to e-collaboration, we'll do what we can to support this process, both for the, um, our members, public education in general and the General Assembly. Um, public meetings, I think, are pretty important, both in terms of hearing from the public and also helping the public understand what we are looking at. Um, with regard to the modeling, I thought Representative Ansel's question about sort of not just ESSER, but the um, elements of the funding system in their entirety are very important. I believe that the last modeling was done by the Joint Fiscal Office in February of 2020. That should be um, addressed ASAP because I think that the modeling is what everybody looks at and it's inescapable that everybody's gonna look at it and it needs to inform um, what the General Assembly does and how, how we respond as a public education community. So in summary, I think S13 sets up a good framework. I do think that it needs to be modified and adjusted. Uh, I think the General Assembly should, should come to grips with the question of whether the change of wage is the, an eventuality or whether there's going to be sort of a more comprehensive review. But I think that the momentum and the study and the work that has been done so far would argue that the change of weights should be an eventuality. Thank you. I think that we will be looking at sort of in two buckets, the narrow questions and the broad questions and try to get those organized as to, as to how they relate. Representative Austin and then Representative Till. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, Mr. Francis, uh, Superintendent Francis, um, realistically between now and full implementation, let's say if we just, you know, implemented the weights, how long do you think that would be? I don't know. I mean, I think there needs to be a slope. And I think that the, um, that that's, it was recognized in age 54. I think that it's a thought process that ought to carry over. Um, but I, I don't have a recommendation with the, what the timing should be. You have, would you have an estimate, like a, a just a guess, just so just to understand, is it, are we looking at five years or three years, just to have a sense of what it might uh, be? Yeah, I mean, I I appreciate the question, but my answer is the same. I'm not prepared to respond to that today. Okay, thank you, Representative Till. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank Two you. Things. I'm out of speaker. Sorry. It's just it's such, such a big group. All time too. It's such a big group. It looked like it was the whole. Um, two things. One is um, poverty. We're putting so much weight on poverty. And I um, am concerned about how we're defining poverty. 
and it has been very, very difficult for me to track down um, how the poverty numbers for our school district have been arrived at. Um, in fact, when I look at the numbers, it says two towns in our of our five towns have zero school age students in poverty. Richmond and Jericho have zero students. You know, when I drive around Jericho, that doesn't make any sense to me. And when I try to track it down, it's really, really hard to, to figure out how they are determining poverty. And so the one, one qualification I would have is, yes, I'm sure that poverty is very important, but I am not the least bit certain that how we are determining poverty right now is accurate. And that throws a large wrench into this. And so I really think that this task force needs to look at how we define poverty for these purposes of weighting the students. If, if I might comment on that, I, I would argue Representative Till, well, I first of all, I'd agree with you. I think it's an even more pressing issue than this study, um, this process, because now, I'm Sue, sorry. Sue, Sue Siglowski and I um, have, were engaged in a series of meetings throughout the late winter where we were trying to get a handle on that ourselves. And I, I would say, and I think this is a, I think this comment is appropriate. Uh, a lot of, you know, school districts have the same question about that. So that issue of how that determination is made should be a fundamental part of the basis for this work. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, for, uh, Superintendent Botsajerns, I don't know if you heard the comments, but uh, you used to be the assistant superintendent in uh, uh, Mount Mansfield. And what the, the poverty ratings currently say is we don't have a single student from Jericho or under or um, Richmond who are, who are in poverty. And I was saying, I do not see that that makes any sense whatsoever. And it's so fundamental to this discussion of uh, implementing the, the weighting. The second thing is actually even more troubling. Um, and that's this. We got testimony from a national expert who said that um, the results of this study, um, as, as much confidence as he has in the, the people doing the study, the results of the study um, are an outlier in terms of how much weighting to give to poverty and ruralness and those sort of things. And he made a comment that you could predict the outcome by knowing who was doing the study, who the national expert is on the study, which gave me great pause. And I don't know how anybody else feels about that, but um, I think the task force really needs to, to look at whether in fact, these results and these weights are really a significant outlier from other studies that have been done across the country. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but um, that, that, that gave me great pause also. I'm gonna leave that probably as rhetorical at this point um, so that we can move on. I know we have guests in the room. Um, but I think you've raised some, I, I watched, I followed some of the questions that you had, Representative Till, and agree that it, it remains a, a question. Representative Ansel, perhaps you could close this, ask your question and close this. Well, I, I'm yeah. afraid mine may sound rhetorical as well, because it's, a, it's sort of a, a follow-up on what Representative Till said. The, the testimony that we got, and, and I'm happy to hear comments from the, uh, the witnesses that we've heard today, if they have them, um, particularly um, Mr. Nichols said we should accept the weights in the study without, um, without questioning them. The testimony we got in our committee um, is, is in fact that those recommended weights would be outliers. And one of the questions, and they've been recommended in other states. One of the questions I asked is whether any state had adopted them. Um, and the answer was unequivocally no. Um, so we would, if, if we adopt them um, from in whatever time frame we're talking about, um, at least according to the expert that we uh, heard from, we would then be an outlier. And so I, I just, uh, I think it's an important point and I would be very interested in comments from uh, witness, or witnesses on that question. 
um, if they care. Okay. Can I comment on that, Representative Webb? Please do. <clears throat> That's a great question. So when I saw the results of the study, not being an expert in, in school finance, although I do teach a school finance class, <laughs> principles but that's about developing a budget that's a lot different than what you're talking about i don't know i don't know with 100 validity myself if those are the right scores what i'm saying is that we hired a group that we thought presumably you know we're going to come back with answers that seem to make sense how we go about implementing that i think is is up to you as a as a legislature what i don't want to see us do though is to end up in a situation where where nothing happens over time I'm much more inclined to, you know, sometimes it's really good to ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim, but sometimes you need to fire. And so I would rather see something, something implemented that helps these uh, districts that have been in such need for such a long period of time than nothing. And I'm reminded of Kozel's work in the 70s where you had East St. Louis with the ceiling tiles falling down and West St. Louis where the kids were all, they had, everybody had new textbooks and all kinds of high quality stuff and it was just across the river because in one place the coca-cola plant closed and the other did not now we're way above that because of brigham so we definitely have you know we have equity in terms of the amount of pain each taxpayer has to pay to fund our system but we don't have equity on the opportunity end for students and i think that needs to be addressed and i'm not sure what the right weights are i know that the effect size for Social economic lower status is around 0.67. So that's roughly uh, a year's worth of learning that a kid uh, loses over three or four years just based on poverty if there are no, no other factors. And of course, there are always other factors. I just think it's something we definitely need to look at and address. Um, Jeff Francis, did you want to respond? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I understand the point. What we, I mentioned the testimony that we heard from Tammy Colby herself and Secretary French, and you know, uh, she accounts for the work that was done in this study very well. And Secretary French, not to put words in his mouth, but he um, was not questioning the validity of the study. So I, you know, if you were gonna so, sort of cut to the chase. You, you want to make sure that you got value in the investment that's been made in the study. And I think it's within reason that the General Assembly would do that. But, uh, but that's not, I mean, that fundamentally, I think as fiscal agents, that's an obligation, but you, you, you want to answer that question and, and move on other, uh, because people are expecting action, they're waiting for action. And and I think that the system deserves it. So, but I, I do understand the importance of making sure that the information you're relying on has integrity. I guess all of that goes without saying. Um, I've not questioned the study because it looks like a credible study to me. I'm not an expert and I haven't heard testimony from other experts. Okay, um, Representative Odie, let's make the last one for this uh, particular round and then we will be hearing from uh, Winooski School District. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, was excited to hear that I would be hearing from the national expert whose name I'd heard for years. And then I was completely unimpressed by his testimony throughout and was completely impressed by the testimony of uh, Tammy Colby. So I, and the work that had gone into that study. So yes, we should listen to what the comments of that national expert were, but I don't think that for me, that was completely not determinative. Okay. You weren't looking for a response. Correct, at this point, Representative Oli, that was just a statement. <laughs> okay, I thank you uh, very much, um, our principals and teachers and um, superintendents and school boards for um, continuing to uh, help advise us in this question, we hear you. I think right now I wanna turn to some people who are actually in the field. And the first is Dr. Alex Yin, 
who is a member of the Winooski School District School Board. So, um, Dr. Yin. Thank you, Chair Webb, for um, giving this opportunity to um, speak in front of the House Education Committee and Honorable um, Chair Ansel, knowing that I'm also with the House um, Ways and Means Committee here. And, and really, I'm speaking on the opportunity on behalf of the Coalition of Vermont Student Equity, um, of Vermont Student Equity, and, you know, a coalition that I really appreciate because it's a, it's a, it's a coalition that unites urban and rural areas all together because we have this passion to like make sure that we have a healthy and future um, of Vermont. And I am speaking here just to give you a kind of an outline of the presentation I have here is really about um, implementing the recommendations of the people waiting for you, but also to give you experiences that I have in Winooski and submit our recommendations for S13. And, and what I'm hoping to do here is really give you a sense of how to turn those recommendation reports of numbers into the on the ground kind of validity support because there are two types of validity here it's not just the numbers here if we always turn everything into a numbers game we know that people are not defined by ones and zeros but there are actual action items here and i hope i highlight that and link those numbers with these experiences and i know that like in, in many ways like i, I want to get this concept out here too is that educational equity is foundational to ensure that we have a democracy because the democracy is all about having an educated populace and so when we don't have educational equity the democracy becomes kind of like weakened in a little bit and, and, and i want to make sure that you know that because we are vermonters who have this passion for equity and democracy and it is totally linked together and i think you all had a sense that this was kind of like tumbling because the legislator actually asked to do this research to see if there was you know, equitable funding in the distribution of funds when you asked Tammy Colby. Remember, that was an ask. And she gave the research and to actually ask and say that she doesn't have the expertise is kind of mind boggling to me in one sense, because she did do the research and it is a little bit progressive. And here's how I'm gonna show you the impact of this. In our school district, a Winooski school district, we have about 800 students, he eyes and ears, you know, like head count. With the current waiting formula, we have about 1,000 students, and that what that equates to is about $16,700 per equalized pupil, okay, just the numbers. But when you do the, um, when you do the new waiting formula that, that is suggested by Tammy Colby, our equalized pupil is up to 16,000 students, which actually means that we've been actually, in the last 20 years, been paying about $10,200 per equalized pupil. You can see how this system has actually made us like not be able to afford. And when I joined the school board, I got to admit, I did not, I thought like, you know, I didn't realize I was actually going to make me, I was going to be making decisions in our school budget on whether to give our students the basic necessities and basically choosing between basic necessities like transportation or school supplies or trying to find ways to actually improve and build a better school building because we had a school building that was fit for 600 students, but we actually have 800. To some of the other kind of challenges and why we decided to choose the, cho the, the building is because we had special education, educational teachers teaching out of repurposed closets and using single bathrooms as closet space. I sacrificed basically getting our students who now have to truck in the snow, six-year-olds that on, on bad sidewalks to get to school. And that's what we were choosing. And this is what happens when you have an inequitable funding formula. Boy, did I wish that I really thought when I was joining the school board that I was actually gonna be making decisions of rather to keep the art program versus like finding new ways to fund new sporting equipment. But that's not what we're doing in Winooski. And, and I'm gonna just make sure you know that my doctorate's in education. And, and one of the things that, and what we study in education here is that we actually understand in the last 30 years, there's a lot of things about education that's changed. It is not about a student going into a classroom and having a teacher lecture them and fill their heads with knowledge. We actually understand that context matters, that life experiences matter, that may impact learning. And that's the impact of generational poverty when you look at it. Generational poverty, 
means that sometimes our parents can't take our students to the healthcare area so that they can see a doctor to be healthy to be learning in the classroom. So what our district decided to do, we decided to build the healthcare space in our school so that the students could go there. Because what we know is a healthy learner is a better learner. And those are some of the other types of multi-tier support, support systems of support that we are implementing here because we understand that there are actions items that we need to take here to help students become better learners. And that's a good thing, right? Because we do believe that all of our students, when we do this, they can be productive residents and citizens in our local and global world. And in Winooski, as you all know, we have a global community there. And that's really exciting there because um, it, it enriches our city and also enriches Vermont. Next slide. But you know, with that new global co community that we have, we also actually have to provide extra resources too. English as a second language learners. And those are well good investments to make for us. Because as Pablo Bose out of University of Vermont has said is that like second generation new Americans or generation becomes a net benefit to the economy. And I'm gonna guarantee you we're too small in Winooski of our 1.5 square miles that economic benefit is not only gonna help Winooski but it's also gonna help all of Vermont. And I wanna make sure you understand that when you have equity, we actually help all of Vermont in all that way. And I gotta admit, I've been very fortunate to meet, uh, to mentor a couple of new American students in our school district. And one of the things, and, and I really do see the benefit paying off. I have one student who did not speak a word of English in eighth grade and in the upcoming fall, he is gonna to go to a top 20 university in the, in the United States on a full ride. And he actually has strong desires to come back to the state to become the future governor of Vermont. And I believe that he will be. I have another student, a first generation student who said that like that kind of extra support that I provided has now her going to another top, top five liberal arts university in the United States. These investments that we make on our children pay off, but here's where I struggle with this. What I'm telling you are exceptions. They're not the norm because of our equity formula. We are building, depending on our community members to fill in the gaps. And that's what's the problem. And, and just let me ask one more like other kind of investment that we do to help with the, that schools serve in the communities is that our investments in our cultural liaisons are so important to connect our children with the, with their parents in the school. Because here's the luxury that most of us have when we're not, when, when we're not English as second language learners is that we can be involved with the schools, right? But we have to pay this extra investment to help the liaisons to keep the parents informed. And it's powerful because it also develops trust with the government. I'm gonna remind you that a lot of our new Americans came to this country, not, not, not really willingly, they were you know, forced out. And so they have this natural distrust of the government. And it's not to say, this is not a commentary about our current government, it's just that they just distrust government because they were thrown out. And this was illustrated even more to me when we had two Swahili students make this beautiful music video. And if you look at my testimony, I provided the link so that you can see the link in video. And it got news press and Representative Welch wanted to meet them and our cultural liaisons had to spend two hours each saying like, hey, this is all right, because they knew that if they got identified, because they were fearful that once the government knew them, they would be tracked and might actually eventually caught, be, be in trouble later on. We actually invited those two young men to come and perform in the state house. So we're yes, yeah. it, it, it's beautiful, right? And, and I hope you get to watch that video, but that's what we do in our town is that we help. And I'm gonna just, you know, it, it kind of put it all in perspective and I'll, I'm, I'm wrapping up here is that oddly enough, when we spend the money that we needed to support our students, the, send, the system would actually penalize us for excess spending threshold. Because remember, they think we're spending 16,000, but we're really spending 10,000. So we can't even provide the money that we need to. And then the other hard part is that then we are evaluated by standardized test scores 
so you've kind of where, where these inequitable systems have hurt us with the you know standardized tech storms and these outcomes hurt us because our realtors then say like you shouldn't live in Winooski because we don't have a great school district. And there's a reason why 60% of our students qualify for reduced lunch in our district. And, and here's the thing, it's because their families can't afford to live anywhere else. And I wanna say that instead of shunning them, Winooski has embraced these challenges. And so I'm asking you, please allow the districts that are willing to accept these challenges to be given a fair chance to educate their students. I hope, and, and what I'm hoping here is that I'm giving you the real life impacts of the current waiting formula and its detrimental impact on our children, and our community. And this is why when I'm asking you in terms of the recommendations is that we don't, not, we don't need to study, a, we don't need another community to study the weights themselves. But what we really need is a plan to implement these weights because we need that support. And I'm gonna end that and say that like, you know, one of the most enduring traits of being a Vermonter is that we are, we do our best to be self-sufficient with the hopes of never needing to ask for help. But you know what I love about us is that when we do ask for help, there's always a Vermonter with the willing and helping hand. And I gotta admit as a Vermonter and as a school board man, I've given my heart and soul in the last four and a half years to give every child in our district a great education. And I've come to realize that I cannot do this alone especially when the system is stacked against our district. Thus, I was grateful when the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity was formed because I realized our district was not alone for fighting equity. And in a time where we are most likely to be polarized than united, I find myself standing side by side with school members from the Northeast Kingdom, Bennington, Burlington, Rutland, Mount Pelier, and the Wyndham, in the, in Wyndham County. Vermonters who are united by our passion for equity and democracy. And yet I realized that we cannot do this alone. I'm humbly asking you for your help. Our children need your help. Please do not frame this legislation in terms of winners and losers, but instead take pride that we will create something that will strengthen the character of our state by ensuring all of our children that they will have an equitable education. And with an educated populace, our democracy will be nourished and strengthened. And so I hope I, the rest of my testimony that submitted has our recommendations where I'm really asking us to focus on the implementations of the weights and not just another study because our district can't do it. We are down with more creativity than you can ever think of, but we are now asking for your help. Categorical aid is another interesting that it's a distractor for us. I don't need any more distractions. I need help. And I can also talk about categorical aid in the sense that like, you know, it's usually this, you know, from a year to year thing, we might not know that we get it or not. And that's not, that's no way for a district to be proactive in planning. That is like- Dr. Okay. Yen, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I'm, I'm keeping track of our clock and that there are other people I think that, that we hear yeah loud and clear that you wanna make sure that we're implementing, we're working yep. to implement this, is that correct? Yep. And, and there is additional testimony. Yep. Um, I just wanna make sure that our committee members have chance, opportunity to ask you questions because you're your first one coming in, yep. um, district coming in. So are there, and I apologize. No, no, and I apologize, I have to leave. Yeah. Okay. I, I do have a question. Um, I'm looking at, uh, your Title I allocations, I'm looking at federal funds coming in. Do you know, are you, we are also hearing that uh, the Vermont schools are sending federal Title I money back to the feds. Do you know if you're sending any money back at this point, which remains a real concern that and we're not using the funds that we have? I would probably defer to my superintendent on that question, but I have a feeling that we're probably not because we use every penny that we can. Yeah. And I think another question of interest to all of us is um, you have a significant amount of co money coming in from ESSER, and I'm hoping that uh, that will, will help. I see you've got about, you've got almost 12 million coming in over three years and wondering if you have um, ideas on, on how you might be spending that. And I, I'm probably asking too broad a question for the time. Yes. 
Once again, I defer to the superintendent in, in, on our that, but I do know that we are planning and thinking strategically. That's the beauty of our school district is that we always plan and think strategically. But I also want to add that, you know, these funds are usually one time in three years and they do run out. But when, and, and I want to use this analogy with technology, we always know that technology changes on a yearly basis and you need a steady stream and, and a dependable source of when the money is coming. That is the same thing when you do with equity. You don't solve equity and generational poverty with one-time funds, right? And, and that's the analogy that I wanted to make sure that is clear to folks. I'm also concerned that I see on my paper that what Winooski is only, uh, you only are counting 28.24% uh, a poverty ratio, which sounds low to me, doesn't sound accurate. It so. is, and we've been working with, you know, understanding the counts and stuff. And, and, and that yeah. has been um, one of the works that we have to do because we also know, once again, I mentioned the distrust of government. It means that there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be filled from sometimes from families, right? Yeah, I think that's a question that other members of, of our two committees have as well. Is there anybody else that had a question? I will tell you that I did teach in Winooski at one point. <laughs> Thank you. For and I love that. <laughs> Representative Kornheiser and then Austin. Thank you, I really enjoyed your testimony and the love that you have for your community and the good work that you've been doing there. Um, I am, I guess, confused um, is the best way to explain it about why you see the categorical, categorical grants as a distraction. I think when you first started your testimony, you were talking about really substantial spending and efforts around transportation as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and from my perspective, that's a really clear location where categorical aid is. Um, a really tidy solution that can then open up more of your spending capacity for other things that are more district specific. Uh, one of the issues that I have with category eight, and, and, and this is related to my regular work at the university is in with TRIO programs that I've worked at. So I worked at um, University of Vermont, but I previously worked at Penn State. And the example that I give is, is that TRIO programs from federal governments are great, but they're usually up as a startup funds. And then um, they can be pulled away when we don't get the grant. And when you don't get pulled away the grant, then you're stuck with the situation that you're trying to plan elsewise. Whereas if you know that, that there's a steady stream of money that comes in, you can plan accordingly. So category eight is me is thinking that it's a reactive as a proactive. Thanks, I appreciate that. And, and, and please note that, thank you. I, pre I appreciate the recognition of the passion for Winooski, but please note that it's also a passion for being a Vermonter. Um, oh, Representative Till. Um, yes, thank you for your, your testimony as a former longtime school board member. Um, just changing the weights does not bring Winooski more money. It purely lowers their tax rate. I, so my question to you is, how confident are you as a school board member that you're going to be able to sell to the citizens of Winooski increasing their tax rates to um, you know, or not reducing their tax rates as a result of this, but instead keeping their tax rates where they are now to, to actually get the money that um, you know the extra weights kind of imply you need. And, and, and I think there's a point of clarification and I'll let others to either correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it's actually increasing our taxing capacity so that I know that our current tax rates, we would actually get more money for what we are getting taxed at our current rates. And so well, that like- Well, you actually have to set your tax rates every year. Right, but in theory, the, the, the taxing capacity allows us more um, funds to actually pay um, for what, and if we're passing certain um, budgets already, with the, at the certain tax rate, then I know that that is at least the minimum that we're willing to accept and that the taxing capacity would hopefully give us more funds at that point. Um, we, I, I guess I'll say only if you can convince your taxpayers to vote for it. I mean, once again, I think that we've already convinced them that we at the certain certain rates that, that we have. I mean, you know, one of the hardest part as a school board member is to explain to them that our budget is not always correlated with our tax rates. You know, and as a statistician, I'm like, I've had to do that stand up and I'm the one that does sit up in front of our community and talk about the need. And we do those efforts and I have great confidence that we will be able to do 
continue our conversations on that level. And you are in the, you're well below the excess spending threshold as I'm looking. Yeah. Looking yes. At this. Yeah. So, um, Representative Maslin, and then I want to invite in our next guest because we have some others. <laughs> the taskmaster today. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Yin, I find that I'm in agreement with Representative Kornheiser in that categorical aids for in certain certain areas would be actually very straightforward and very helpful. Um, you did say what happens if we don't get the grant a certain year, but I think if the if the if the categorical aid is structured so you don't have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops and can be denied for something that you clearly need, then categorical aid, for instance, for for uh, ESL students or or um, poverty students or some such a thing like that could be um, very straightforward and helpful. So, um, I can't reveal. I know that's not exactly a question, but it's a comment. But um, right. I'm responding to your to your comment. Mm -hmm. and, and I got to admit, as a school board member, I don't have that control. I'm still dependent on something else. But I do know that if we change the weighting formulas and, and really focus on what this, the recommendations are on the weighting formulas, at least I know that that's dependable on a yearly basis to a certain degree. Okay, I'm going to move on to our next witness. And this is Mr. Kolb, and I'm hoping that we can keep this within about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, sure. um, thank you, and uh, just a small correction, Chair Webb. It's CORB, K-O-R-B for the record. Oh, um, and uh, apologies, but you know I consider it a metaphor, but there's a giant thunderstorm. Uh, thank goodness for, for clearing the drought that's rolling through Marlboro as we speak. Uh, and you know, just as introduction, uh, my name is Douglas Core. I'm chair of the Marlboro School Board. We are a rural uh, small school district in southern Vermont. Um, we are part of the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity, uh, which Alex is a member as well, and Winooski. Um, I'd like to start uh, simply by acknowledging that I'm sorry this committee has the task of rectifying this inequity issue. Um, it's been more than 20 years uh, since the passage of Act 60. And by my understanding, the weighting of pupils should have been a focus immediately after its passage. Um, but nonetheless, um, Marlboro School Board, uh, other small, rural, impoverished, and high English language learning districts are here as allies. Um, we hope to provide information, and um, we also hope to be part of the task force uh, in, in an advisory capacity if necessary. Um, we aim to provide information, support, and examples for how the original improper weighting has negatively impacted our schools and communities these last 20 years. Uh, the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity is here to aid you in your work. We only ask in return that you give back an equitable distribution of tax burden for all taxpayers in Vermont. Uh, we feel the best, most expedient way to do that is by implementing the weights in accordance with the Pupil Weighting Factors Report, which was led by Dr. Colby, uh, who was here last Thursday, um, speaking to you. Uh, as you heard from Dr. Colby's testimony, solving the inequity issue starts by adjusting the weights in the formula. And I can't, <laughs> she said many times, full stop, you know, we, we know there's the issue. It's just implementation that is what we should be discussing. Um, while there are many implementation factors to consider, as outlined by Dr. Colby, uh, the focus and goal of the task force should be on coming back and implementing the weights. Um, there's enough to focus on in that study. Uh, still, the nationally publicized study gives you the roadmap to do so. Uh, as Dr. Colby said, you have excellent thought partners in this process. Marlboro and others from our coalition insist you utilize them and most importantly, listen to their guidance. We also ask that the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity be added to the group of stakeholders, as I mentioned before. Um, it's, it would be difficult for the task force to operate in a vacuum uh, without hard examples uh, when discussing implementation. Uh, but with your indulgence, I'd like to walk you through the impacts the improper weighting has had uh, and will have if delay occurs. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Marlboro, it's a town located in Southern Vermont on the side of Hogback Mountain. Uh, we have an annual population of 700 and it covers 36 square miles, the majority of which are class three dirt roads. Uh, so we have two paved roads, I think essentially running through Marlboro. Uh, our nearest school, uh, Building Neighbor, uh, they're located down uh, the curved and dangerous Route 9 in Brattleboro, where there's a difference of 1,000 feet of elevation. Uh, so Marlboro uh, is the shining example in the Pupil Weighting Factors report for, for where it's stated as less than 36 persons per square mile. Um, so 
it's a weight outlined in the study. Um, when the pupil weighting factors report was released in 2019, uh, it finally answered a question uh, that we've been asking ourselves for quite some time. Why can we not adequately fund our school? Uh, each year, the Marlboro School has been forced to kick the can uh, further down the road on various capital improvements or bid farewell to student program resources. Uh, we've wished to not overburden the taxpayers who've generously supported increases to their tax rate at select times. Um, but last year, um, after being faced with a 30 cent tax increase, as well as a leaking roof in the fifth and sixth grade, the dam literally broken, almost like the rain that's coming down right now. Um, we can no longer maintain a school that has adequate school facilities and learning environments. Our town firmly understands the term tax capacity. The average income in Marlboro is $50,000 for a family of four per the last census. And we have about 500 families from which to raise an average per pupil cost of $20,000. And additionally, while other towns appear to be losing students, we appear to be growing. Based on current projections, Marlboro's enrollment could go from 80 ADM, average daily membership, for those that hate acronyms <laughs> like me, uh, 80 ADM two years ago to 120 by 2022. Uh, our school's bursting at the seams. Uh, we need facility improvements. Uh, but this, this growth excites us. It, it excites us for our school's community's future. Um, the education funding formula needs to start working with us, though, instead of against us. Uh, and for this reason, we disagree with the use of categorical aid to fix the issue. Uh, I think Secretary French put it best last Thursday when he said, quote, categorical aid would be raised from tax rates. And if the rates are unequal, how would that further the goals of Act 60? So the state of Vermont does not have a fundraising issue. It has an inequitable tax rate issue. And I'm hoping that when your work is done with S13 and the makeup and mission of the task force, it proposes that you'll aim to have that task force focus solely on how to implement the weights. So with regard to excess spending, uh, for many years, Marlboro was able to stay below the excess spending threshold. However, over the last few years, especially with growing ADM numbers, um, they're always a year behind in the funding capability. Uh, our excess spending threshold is simply anticipated to be in the budget before the board even starts discussions on programming needs. Um, so this penalty on top of an already inequitable education tax rate is unjust. Uh, we, would, we would ask that you suspend the excess spending threshold while the task force undertakes its work. Thank you. Um, Representative well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, oh. <laughs> I'm not okay. finished. I see a sip of water. Okay. Uh, I understand you would like me to, to speed it up, but there's a lot to kind of go through. Um, right. And accompanying this testimony, I've sent a four minute video to you. Um, it's in your inboxes and I encourage you all to watch it. Uh, there's two students and a teacher put it together. Uh, but you know, the most striking element is not what they're showing you. It's it's the pure and simple fact that these two articulate eighth grade students are fully aware of the disparity that exists across the districts. And it's not just adults that are in this conversation. And I beg you not to forget that fact. Um, edu educational resources like full-time reading and math, uh, professional development for teachers, special programs for students, um, uh, counselors and nurses to meet health education needs, they are truly the most valued aspects of our school. But I, but I beseech you that you know, they're abstract. Uh, there's no better concrete example to prove the disparity that exists um, it, than when you see an old unsafe play structure removed and nothing new is erected in its place due to lack of funding. Um, it's difficult to explain to a seven-year-old that they don't have a play structure because there's a new state mandate that needs to be met in health insurance or elsewhere. Uh, and as mentioned before in Act 173 with the block grant coming, uh, we could build that play structure but with a penalty, it would cost us twice as much and put us in further danger of not passing our budgets, which has been mentioned in other committees, especially in the Senate. Uh, I'm extremely proud to be the chair of Marlboro School because we have a supportive community. Um, however, I cringe when I hear conversations in this committee and others about trusting districts to use their educational funds and not simply take, quote, a tax break. Um, for representatives who think that on this committee or others, I invite you to attend or watch one of our school board meetings. Instead of a tax break <laughs> request from the community, I would expect a line of Marlboro community members lobbying the school board to bring back so much programming that we've lost or add literacy supports. Uh, and I definitely expect a community member to say, please move the art room out of the storage facility closet. <laughs> and while you're at it, bring back the FTEs that you cut in art on top of that. Um, as I said at the beginning of this testimony, Marlboro is far from the only school that struggles to raise funds the way other schools do. Um, and the majority of Wyndham County districts have been underweighted for the last 20 plus years. 
and many districts that are overweighted in our supervisory union support implementation of the weights. And the reason is that these students are all of our students. So Marlboro, which is an underweighted district, will see students eventually travel to Brattleboro and beyond for high school. And Dover, which is an overweighted district, will see its students travel to Leland and Gray. However, we both support this implementation, uh, irregardless, because we both know that it's going to impact the students' success in secondary schooling. Uh, we're both K to eight schools. Um, and while I'm happy to be here today with my colleague in the coalition, uh, I just wish there was no need for a coalition. You know, it took us a year to organize and our membership's growing each month because people are realizing um, what this issue is. Uh, and they also understand that it's affecting a majority of districts. Um, but, you know, finally, just two more comments based on what was said earlier uh, in this test in the, uh, in the session and regarding categorical aid. Um, you know, I once heard medical research described as something that, you know, trickles out into the medical community to primary care providers and other pr practitioners. Uh, and, you know, maybe a doctor will get a conference, uh, will go to a conference or, or, or um, you know, read something in a journal or on a webinar. But, you know, I think of this example when I think of categorical aid because Vermont has a serious equity issue. It's almost like a health problem. Uh, and the testimony of Dr. Colby, Secretary French, and districts like ours is basically equivalent of having the CDC, university researchers, patients telling you what will work. And to not act on that information and not to listen to them is negligent. Uh, be continuing to give a patient morphine when you could literally cure them. Um, ensuring implementation of the weights instead of the categorical aid uh, will help cure the problem and not cover it up. And then lastly, uh, regarding the changing of the ed fund model from, um, I guess, tying it to property taxes to the income tax, I feel like that's a valiant a valiant effort, but you know, um, I've heard arguments in favor of it. Um, but the pursuit is essentially that um, it shouldn't be part of S thirteen, um, and immediate relief is needed. Uh, it's it's not about how, it's about how you get the money, not how it's distributed. So just like anything else, you'll be inviting another study of various models in different states. Uh, there's going to be lobbyists on both sides of the aisle, and there'll be draft after draft of legislation as representatives roll off and on committees. Uh, and we know how democracy works. And while that's all happening, in my eyes, you know, the equivalent of two to three middle schools will have gone through sixth to eighth grade and graduated. It's disturbing when you think about it from the viewpoint of a child, you know, they're not gonna get that time back. So with that, I yield questions. Thank you. Um, Representative Maslin, is that what we call an old hand or a new hand? <laughs> it's old, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in another committee I know of, they come down as soon as I shut my mouth. Thank you. No, we, we, in this, this year on your own, you have to do it yourself. Okay. We're self-sufficient here, Annette. Um, I'll do my best. Representative Arison. Thank you. Uh, what my question is, I'm assuming that Marlboro is a sending town for the high school students. And I also read that your student population is rising and I'm just uh, curious the effect that uh, tuitions that you really don't have any control over when you send your high school students is having on your ability to fund your, your elementary school. And incidentally, I watched the video and it's a great sales uh, video for uh, Bill H426. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I feel like there are a lot of uh, um, things tying together, you know, schools are communities and communities have, you know, reasons. There's reasons why our, we have dirt roads that are class three. You can see where we're putting our money. It's to our school. We value our school immensely in this town. And so when I hear people talk about the tax break issue, it sort of gets me a little upset. Um, but with regard to high school, um, a lot of, I'd say the majority of our children uh, do tuition into Brattleboro, um, which we pay the state rate. Uh, and then other uh, schools, uh, you know, we have great schools that work with us too. I can't really, I don't want to say I need to promote them, but, you know, they either go level or less with the state funding model. So um, I just like to say that, you know, we do, we do tuition out. Um, I can get you harder numbers if you want to email me. I'm happy to respond with my superintendent's help and, and the principal too. Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. I just want to clarify, do you, is your ADM 120 now K-8? No, uh, ADM has fluctuated. Uh, I started on the board in 2015. At that time, we had about 80, 80 to 85. Every year it's gone up. 
Um, we anticipate currently right now with the pandemic, we would have been seeing maybe 110, 113, but next year, uh, as you know, there was a, a big transition of uh, the Marlboro College. Uh, we have a new people there and there's a whole new host of folks that work there that have children. Uh, we anticipate them sending students to 120. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've been turning people away for early education, preschool. Um, because we just don't have the space. We don't have the capacity to grow. And, and as you know, as again, this is all tied in, right? There's, there's other bills related to pre-K and early education. And I feel like there's a real disconnect between you know, the facilities that are in Vermont, the infrastructure of the building, uh, you know, what things have been gone away because we just had to get rid of them for safety reasons versus what we need to, we need to build up. You know, the, the governor himself is inviting people to move and work remotely and bring families. But if we don't have the space for them, what are we going to do? Yeah, I'm just, uh, so would it be safe to say your student teacher rate, ratio is about one to 15? Um, I can't get you that hard number off the top of my head. Um, that's not my skill set, <laughs> but I will get, get it to you from my principal immediately following this. Great, thank you. But we have, uh, we, we essentially are a makeup of joint classrooms. So we have a, a, K, a, a, a preschool, a K, we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, and then uh, we're considering next year going with a six, seven, eight. Uh, we traditionally had two teachers in the seventh and eighth, but we're going with just two teachers, four, six, seventh, and eighth fully. So, and also our principal has um, cut down his hours, and he has a great. We're lucky to have a principal with a science background, and he's going to start leaning in and teaching science so that we can make these, you know, so we can, you know, put money toward a math specialist, which is what we're looking for next year. So. Next question. Thank you, Representative Kornheiser. Thank you so much for being here. It's good to see you. Um, Thanks, Emily. I absolutely know that you, your district is incredibly supportive of whatever budget your board presents um, and is looking for resources for your students all the time. I just want to um, sort of clarify that when I talk about categorical grants, I'm not talking about them as a replacement for the weights. I'm talking about them as part of the greater whole. So. You know, I know that you have a lot of um, construction and facility challenges, and maybe there's another option for making sure that we're covering that on a statewide level. Or um, when we think, you know, when you talk, when we talk about special ed or sending schools, I just, you know, you've brought up so many issues that intersect with each other in this big hole. And while I see that. Um, the coalition has a lot of fear that if we widen this task force, we're not going to get it done. Um, I think it's just so hard to talk, so difficult to talk about any of these issues as separate from each other because tax capacity and spending and the things that spending is needed for are really just all mixed up together. And I don't think we can separate them when we're examining the issue. And so I really, um, I have a lot of trust in your district that you want what's best for kids and best for their community and that you're willing to spend on that. And I wanna make sure that as we explore that issue as a, as a body in the legislature, that we're doing it in a way that's taking all of the different factors into account so we can meet the needs of kids throughout the school districts. I, I completely respect that approach. Um, only to a point, because I feel like you can't tackle the whole thing at one time, right? You know, I think. Dr. Colby said it, you know, best when she was essentially stating that, um, you know, the study that was requested focused on the weights and how to implement them. You know, if you want to look at funding things from the income tax perspective, totally great, value and pursuit, do it, but don't make us wait five years for that to happen. Additionally, with categorical aid, we are recipients of a small schools grant. Those definitions shaved and changed over time. It just went, it sort of became from 100 schools down to 35 when I-46 happens. So I have to say, you know, as committees change, you know, you change the formula and you're, you're basically, that's, that's not gonna change. We can rely on that, we can trust on that. You know, I just feel like this task force should focus on the weights and how to implement them solely because if you go too wide, as Dr. Colby said, you're gonna go an inch deep. You don't wanna do that. Thank you. Um, last question from Representative Odi. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I would have to just ask, why now? 
why ask all the questions about all the other categorical uh, grants and all the other things, Title I, ESSER, why ask these things now? You put because of the way, because of the the waiting study, those are things that you would ask basically about an entire f funding formula. Representative Odie, who's your question to? Oh, I'm just, I don't know. Oh, all right. Well, I'll ask uh, Mr. Korb. What would you say? Why Why do you think these questions are being asked now about all these other things that are that are beyond the weights? I will. Um, I have an answer. Um, I will definitely email you <laughs> why I feel that way. But in general, um, I feel like, you know, even last Thursday, there are questions that are asked that obfuscate from relief. And I really want that to be clear and resonate. And I really appreciate that both committees are here, the Ways and Means and the House Ed, because when statements are made to talk, you know, they're, they're distractions. Uh, they, when, when it's talked about, well, how are they gonna spend the money? You know, or how are we going to uh, raise funds? That's not really the question. The question is, we have a distribution problem and it's, it's, it's a poison in, in the ed funding model. And if we fix that, and I think, uh, was it Mr. Nichols before who said, if we fix that, you guys can set up in the task force even somebody to monitor it if we change the weights while you're working on something else, but there needs to be relief. I mean, we can't go another five years uh, because I mean, honestly, some representatives won't be here next session, some representatives will. And you know, this bill that started out as 13, that was originally uh, Phil Burr's bill um, and it has changed. And now it's a completely different bill than what it was. And I know bills change, but I'm just giving you an example of where you can go. And, and I feel like at the end of this task force, there needs to be action and that would be, a real neglect and, and we'd be knowingly keeping people in poverty um, and children down. Uh, I think that that's just wrong. Um, I am going to need to leave. I have another meeting. I'm turning the chair over to Representative Coopley and I will check back. I think I just wanna make sure when we get to Megan Roy that uh, we make sure that we speak with her about uh, uh, the potential impact of the weighting factors, maintenance of effort and the census-based funding model as we go forward. So if someone could remember to address that, I'd appreciate it. So uh, Representative you, uh, Bookley, you're in charge. Yeah, Representative Beck, I believe you have a question. No, just a, a comment to the previous question. The reason why looking at all of this, all of this is there are multiple inequities in the education funding system that impact the education kids receive and the tax rates that taxpayers receive. And um, pupil waiting is just one of them. And so if you address one of them and ignore the other inequities in the system, then you end up with an inequitable system still. Thank you, uh, Representative Beck. Um, we're <clears throat> running about a half an hour behind here and uh, we certainly have two um, very important important testimonies coming up. And I would like to uh, introduce Megan Roy, who is the Director of Student Support Services for the Vermont Council Special Education. And uh, Megan, um, you have the floor. Welcome. Great, thank you, Representative Kubley. Um, I will, I'll, I'll try to be brief and focused. Um, so my name is Megan Roy. I am the chair of the legislative committee for VCSEA um, and also a director in Chittenden County. Um, so my goal today is just to uh, reiterate and make sure the committee, as they continue this conversation, um, make sure that they're keenly aware of a, a few different policy constructs that are about to intersect as we talk about um, people waiting and some other recent changes to uh, funding specifically in special education. Um, VCSEA acknowledges and supports the move toward equity that um, is coming, the conversations that are coming out of the waiting study, um, acknowledge that our current weight um, were not developed by any formal research base and don't match what we know um, it costs to educate students. Um, so uh, we're in support of um, of the work to move for, towards implementation, our goal is to make sure that when we do that, we do it in a way that understands all of the various issues. So I'm gonna talk about three things. Um, and then I have a relatively um, specific 
piece that I would add to F13 to make sure those three things are addressed, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so the three policy constructs are the waiting study, um, the shift to a census-based funding model for special education, that's Act 173, and then as part of Act 173, um, the construct of maintenance of effort and the impact that that will have on districts. Um, and I agree with uh, a few of the previous um, folks testifying about the intersection of all these things. That's really what I'm here to talk about is to make sure that that intersection is considered moving forward. Um, in terms of the waiting study, I don't have a lot to add to the testimony that you've already heard. CCSDA supports and understands the need to review the process of waiting um, and uh, addressing the inequities in the current system is in line with um, our own push toward uh, equity. So as it pertains to a shift to a census-based funding model, as this committee is well aware, um, we're entering a, a change in how we fund special education. So districts will no longer receive special ed, state special ed funding through reimbursement for services, we'll receive a census grant. Um, and while it's true that the premise for reducing or for shifting to a census grant was um, done to increase the flexibility that districts have to be able to spend their special ed dollars, um, it's also true that the issue of cost containment was part of the conversation leading up to passing of Act 173. So there, there is an intent um, uh, through program change, which we support, um, but there is an intent to decrease special education spending. And as the state moves into implementation of a census grant, um, many districts, about half in Vermont, will see a decrease in state special education support. Um, but their need to provide those entitlement services does not go away with a decrease of support. So um, one of two things will happen when a district receives fewer state dollars, they will um, either need to uh, increase spending on the general ed side of the budget, um, or they'll need to reduce costs. Both of those things impact something I'll talk about in a minute, which is maintenance of effort. Um, but simply put, it's important that the task force referenced in F13 and the General Assembly um, as a whole understands as weights shift and schools receive their overall ed funding differently, they're also gonna see a difference in their state special education funding. And we need to make sure that those things are understood. Um, it's also important uh, as part of the rulemaking process that was um, undertaken when Act 173 was passed, um, there are pretty significant changes to the state's definition of special education, moving us into alignment with federal definitions, all positive changes. Um, but uh, it is, there is a very real possibility that some districts percentage of students eligible for special education may increase. Um, I say may, we won't know until this is implemented, but my, in my professional opinion, I think we, we may see increases. We will see increases in students eligible for special education, but because we will no longer be in a reimbursement model, there won't be a commensurate increase in um, special ed funding. So again, this is just context that's important to be aware of um, as we talk about the waiting study. So the third and really important piece, and this committee has heard VCSEA talk about this um, for many years, including in the lead up to passing of Act 173. Maintenance of effort is a federal requirement that ensures that districts continue to fund special education. And it's defined as spending at least as much in support of special education services as you have the previous year, there's a state requirement for maintenance of effort and there's a local requirement. Both are true and I'm really speaking to the local requirement. So LEAs need to spend at least as much as they have the previous year. Um, there are some exemptions in the federal law that have to do with um, you know, students exiting the system, uh, you know, retirements that are replaced by uh, lower costs. So there's some specific exemptions. But just being more efficient in how you spend special education dollars is not an exception, which means if we lower our costs because we have changed our programming, which is the intent of Act 173, that's not an allowable exemption for maintenance of effort. Um, and that 
we're going to start to understand what that looks like um, as we're as we're implemented. And some districts who stand to receive more state special education funding uh, may not even face this. Uh, issue, but districts that are going to receive less special ed funding are either going to spend less on special education, causing them to fail their maintenance of effort test, um, or they're going to shift the cost of special education funding onto the, uh, you know, general ed budget. Um, if a district does not maintain effort, uh, fails their maintenance of effort test, they risk losing uh, federal funding. Uh, usually part of their idea B grant. Um, and I, you know, I have heard in conversations, people uh, talk about how, well, you know, that's okay, we'll be more efficient overall. Um, so if we lose a little federal funding, that's, um, that's okay. But that's, that's not, that's not really the case. Districts use their idea B funding to fund essential special ed services. So if we get a reduction in that federal funding, um, it'll imp we will still have to, again, provide those services. So my, my goal is not to, um, it is simply to make sure that as we pass uh, legislation to enact a task force, that that task force very explicitly studies those three issues together. Um, and there is language in S13 that asks the task force or puts as a primary responsibility of the task force to study these three issues. We would recommend specifically adding to that section um, that there be modeling of these issues together for LEAs to receive as part of this study. So a district should be able to see, here's what this will look like when we change the pupil weights. Here's what it will look like when we shift to a census grant. And here's what those two things together will do for our maintenance of effort. Um, it's important that that gets put in front of uh, districts and in front of policymakers. So, um, BCFEA's recommendation is um, simply to make sure that we continue talking about those three things and the, to specifically charge the task force with looking at them. Happy to answer questions. Uh, Representative Conlon. Thank you and uh, good morning, Megan. Um, the issue of maintenance of effort has to do specifically with special ed funding and special ed spending. Um, and I think one of the challenges with waiting, you know, tying waiting to maintenance of effort is that there's no guarantee that that waiting, the, the increased taxing capacity will be used to, I guess, make up for um, a potential loss in special ed funding if you're on sort of the other side of the census-based funding formula. Um, I think I've lost my thread for a question, but I guess if you wouldn't mind commenting on, you know, the two are not intrinsically tied together. They're just sort of complementary potentially. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And that's, and that's really our goal is, is to make sure that um, policymakers and districts understand that they impact each other. They're, they, the need you know, there, there's not a lockstep connection between uh, changing a pupil weight um, or, a, or changing to a census grant and maintenance of effort, so long as you continue to maintain your effort for special education. And each district is going to have a different reality when it comes to how those intersect. Some are not going to see a decrease in special ed funding. Therefore, there's probably not a lot of impact on maintenance of effort. So again, the goal is just to make sure that folks understand the connection or understand the need to look at the connection. Representative Austin. Yes, thank you, Megan. Good to see you again. I'm just wondering, I, I also know that we in the Ed Committee and in other committees are putting a lot of money into prevention in um, early childhood. Um, and we just passed a literacy bill to address literacy. Do you, are there any other recommendations or any other big things that you can see so we could possibly, you know, lower the need for students to get individualized education um, if we're missing anything? No, absolutely. I, you know, one of the things that is, um, you know, 
this actually has to do with how the agents, you know, part of what the agency will be doing as they also shift to a census grant is um, they will be rewriting guidance on how they calculate special education spending, because we still have to calculate special ed spending um, in order to document maintenance of effort. And we've advocated, as has the census-based funding advisory group, that the state maintain a flexible definition because fund, so, so we'll use the literacy grant as an example. If the literacy grant is used to purchase literacy interventionists, uh, professionals who are teaching and students on IEPs are, receive support from those literacy specialists, we should be able to count some of those costs towards documentation of maintenance of effort. And in Vermont previously, or actually currently, but in Vermont's current model, we can't count those costs. So there is actually a connection between those prevention activities and our ability to document maintenance of effort. And I'm hoping I'm not going too far in the weeds, but it's, you've raised a really important um, question when it comes to developing guidance, because a, a district can satisfy their maintenance of effort requirements if they're allowed to acknowledge that some of these prevention dollars, buying interventionists or, um, or coaches or you know, literacy programs, that is in support of special education. So um, again, if we if the task force can can really look at those things together and help districts understand that those prevention activities do support special education, that's part of how we will get around this maintenance of effort piece. I hope that's clear because I realize that's a really um, kind of fine point on the finance part, but it's a really good question. And I think the, the question I was asking is, can you see any other initiatives that would prevent students from be, you know, needing specialized education? So not once they're on an IEP, they can look at funding, but in general, can you see any other ways that we can um, address, you know, learning early on, you know, so they don't, you know, I mean, there will always be students that will need specialized instruction, but I wonder if there's anything we can be doing in terms of prevention, more for prevention. More, I'm not, I, what I would say is the shift to a focus on a multi-tiered system of support, which is the programmatic side of Act 173 is the biggest thing that we can continue to support. So that's already in place, but what we need to do is focus on the professional development so that districts can actually make those changes because that is the definition of prevention is to identify and intervene early. And, and this is already happening and it's sort of implied as part of 173, but a good multi-tiered system of support includes pre-K. So, um, you know, the say it looks a little different when you're implementing them across our pre-K model in Vermont, um, but it's the same idea of, do we have information about kids in a way that allows us to flag the kids that need something? And do we have a structure to provide that something and then measure it. So uh, in some ways, the legislation is already there, but it is continuing to support. Thank you. Representative Kornheiser. Thanks, and I'm sorry if everyone else in the committee knows the answer to this question, but um, is the Act 173 funding already modeled somewhere and I just haven't seen that spreadsheet yet? So that's a good question. Um, the shift to a census grant, I believe the last time this was issued was in 2018. I may be wrong on that, but shortly after Act 173 was passed, the state did do modeling for districts to know just what the shift to the census grant would mean for them. So yes, that exists back then. I, I don't think it's been um, you know, recalculated, but there is, there is a spreadsheet that exists. And so really what we're asking is that this task force create a mechanism to look at that plus all of these other impacts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Megan. Um, it's great to have you back. And we're going to uh, turn over to Superintendent Bozat Jorn to uh, continue the conversation. Thank you, Representative Kukali, Vice Chair. And it's, it's nice to see Representative Till, an old companion and also um, 
Representative Beck, who's local, and Representative Williams, thank you for being here. So good morning. I serve as a superintendent of a rural remote Kingdom East School District in the Northeast Kingdom. My prior work was at Mount Mansfield School District in Jericho, and then Montpelier School District, and then I served, at, I served in two independent schools. So I want to begin by saying the waiting study has been completed. It's clear. If you review the appendices and the related algorithms, formulas are from a multitude of states. They use category gate. They, they looked at all of this and it's already been analyzed and it's done. What's needed is not more analysis of the same information, but how to create a funding system in Vermont that's equitable for all children. My reading of S13 is that it wants to determine how various scenarios will specifically impact each region categorical aid, local tax rates, weights. My hope is that the same waiting study research is not cre recreated. The risk with this work of prolonging the decisions via a task force and subsequent public meetings become a land grab based on each district's best interest and their resources to lobby. Our current system shows how that ends. So here's my given S13, here's my recommendation. One. The first step of the task force must be clearly stating the objectives of equity. What does this mean? Do we want children in Concord and Sutton to have the same doors open and opportunities for their future as the children in Norwich and Shelburne? Answer the question specifically first. Secondly, there needs to be a specific connection and segue between student outcomes and fiscal investments, specifically how the two overlap. The wording now says recommend meeting the EQS education quality standards. Third, when reviewing property taxes, other regional influences need to be considered. For example, there is a statewide health care bargaining decision. It's the same for people in South Burlington and Linden. 20% of a copay in South Burlington and Linden impacts the salary that teachers are taking home very differently when one has $10,000 more in their salary. So just by doing something statewide and not looking at those implications, you're not gonna continue to get what you want, which is equity. Four, for the transition to the new weights or categorical aid, outline a specific timeline and be real specific about it. Five, Recommend, so there's a portion about recommending how tuition rates for non-operating school districts and career centers should be adjusted to account for the cost of education st students. The region I am in, we have no, no operating high school. All of our children have high school choice. I don't think you can adjust tuition rates of independent schools. There should be a compensation for districts that have no choice but to tuition and have no control over tuition rates. One of our independent schools this year had a 5% increase in their tuition, and that had a significant impact on our budget. Number six, consider school funding formulas in other states and alternative models for school funding. This was done in the waiting study. I do not recommend redoing this waiting study work of the other formulas that have been done. Take the next step. Number seven, when considering the impact of recommended weights or categorical aid, ongoing capital expense and physical infrastructure need to be included. There's a big discrepancy between a facility that has a gym that is not structurally sound and could collapse if snow were on it, and a gym that can hold a bunch of amazing kids at a game. That's just skims the surface. The facilities needs are really discrepant across the state. So in general, these eight recommendations are based on ensuring equity in the process. Oh, there's one more, my last one, number eight. I'll, I'll give you these numbers so you can, you can make sure they're in order. So the public meetings, when you get public input, it needs to be in different regions and contextualized with the ability and capacity for certain regions to attend the meetings, lobby and promote their own interests. As I said earlier, what we see right now is that's, that's what happens is certain groups and the louder voice tends to win sometimes. So in general, the eight recommendations are based on ensuring equity in the process and that the outcome and the drilling into specific information is essential to make wise funding formula proposals. 
I want to comment on a few items that you asked of several folks that I would be able to answer. Categorical aid, transportation aid. Transportation aid is based on your previous year's spending. So I would like all of my children to be able to do soccer and cross country after school and get a late bus home. In my previous district, that's what happened. So that funding for that district was already baked in and they get their funding for transportation aid based on that. We don't have that. What we have to do is add it. So there's an added cost and it, it's, it's a slow ball in terms of how you get your funding. And many of these categor categorical aid formulas have these little loopholes where it, it is really more challenging for the high poverty areas. The second question, and I, I think uh, Representative Webb asked this, was about sending money back to the federal government. Let me tell you how Title I funds work. You have to look at all of your data you know, how you're doing in math and science. And then you write what's called an investment and you send it off. And then it has to be vetted by the AOE, their, their grant working team. And sometimes we do, do not get our investments back until November, December. So then, okay, we wanna hire a literacy specialist. So in January, we're trying to hire a literacy specialist. Now in our region, where we have 20% attrition rate each year of our teachers. That means teachers come and 20% of them leave each year. And it's not the same 20. It's really hard to hire a literacy coach in January for the balance of the year. So then we try and we work and we try to find someone and we don't get somebody until March. And then we're only paying that portion of the salary when in the grant, we had a whole year's worth of the salary. So then suddenly the, the grant folk are saying, holy cow, you didn't spend the money we wanted to give you. And then, you know, you want to carry it over, but there are deadlines. And the short, long and the short of money that's going back to the federal government, it has to do with the timing and the sequence of how funds are allocated. And I know this happens across the state. Um, so those are, those are my general comments. Um, Representative Webb asked me to talk about how we're spending our ESSER funds. So we have currently our ESSER funds are planned for a robust summer program with outdoor academic recreation and arts activities. And we've hired somebody to run this program who's going to work with all of our schools and our after school program. For ESSER 2, we have a team that's looking at it and we're going to spend money in general in the following areas, social emotional needs. We have places that don't have guidance counselors or librarians. Um, Enrichment needs, arts, music, the number of full-time equivalent for music teachers is far inferior. Like I would love if all of our children were able to play a musical instrument in the middle school. That's, that doesn't happen right now. Academic needs, tutoring and interventions. Facilities needs, uh, many of you have heard me testify about our deteriorating facilities. And then also transportation so students can participate in after school programming. And I, I was thinking about when I worked in the Mount Mansfield district about, I would go to a cross country race at Browns River Middle School. And there would be probably a hundred kids if not more. And that, you know, some of them are, are just going really slowly and some are running really well. And I want the children in our region to be able to have the opportunity to run and get a bus ride home so they can participate and maybe, you know, be an Aaron Sullivan and win a national championship and go to Stanford. We have children throughout our state who have these abilities. And what's happening right now is in some regions, they're not able to open doors. Doors are shut by virtue of funding and our schools. So those are my ESSER funds. Now, one piece I want to talk about in the ESSER funds is our work here, deciding how to use that money is, is hard because it feels like a land grab and people are a bit frothy at the mouth because when you're so under-resourced for so long, it's like, oh my gosh, we need a guidance counselor. Let's use that for a guidance counselor. Oh my gosh, we need a library. Let's use it. For so everybody's wanting this. And statewide, if folks are in the weeds and just looking at our feet and what we need right now, not at the horizon and the sunrise, long-term project and structural changes such as facilities and infrastructure, nothing sticks. Money's done in a few years, poof, program done, back to square one. So... ESSER and the funding formula, they're an opportunity to change the way we envision and deliver um, our system of education. And I fear that the important long range planning will get gobbled up by the immediate needs. And in our region, that's due to lack of resources and, and wanting those needs met. And then I have, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a, a bit of data about um, 
about, about our district. I, I want to add, I, I did say 20% of our teachers um, leave every year on average. We have 32 folks on emergency or provisional licenses right now. What that means is these folks don't have, a they're amazing people, amazing teachers, hard workers. They don't have a major in what they're teaching. And if we want to promote STEM and math and science, and we have one teacher who's teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math and science, and they're on a provisional license, think about the difference between that and a child in a school who's got a dedicated eighth grade science teacher who really can dive into photosynthesis and plant algae and all these pieces it's just the the inequities are really really clear and there's more here but you've heard from many um many folks and i just you know this morning i overheard my facilities manager talking to a custodian in one of our schools and the custodian shared that there's water seeping out of the wall and they checked all the pipes and it's not in the pipes it ends up that the pipes are copper and they've oxidized because of the wall and we have to tear out the whole wall so i've testified here in the past and i've showed lots of pictures and i can tell you from direct experience that the conditions in our areas where we do not have as much funding coming toward us are, are disproportionate and i also want to point out you know um, representative till said that the waiting study is an outlier and it is. And I want to be an outlier. And when I was uh, in a different region of the state, we were an outlier. We were ranked nationally in terms of uh, school schools to choose in terms of quality and uh, academics. And now we're an outlier on the other side. And that's because we don't have enough resources. And that's the question before us that we really need to address. So I'm happy to take any questions. I appreciate you listening to my testimony. Yes, Representative Kornheiser. A very simple question. I really appreciated your testimony and it seemed as though you were reading it from something. And I wondered if I could have a copy of it because I don't see it on the legislative website. Yes, wow. I, I have it here and I generally give it after because when other people testify, I add things. Um, so if I send it ahead of time, sometimes you, you don't want to send it and then have it redone. So yes, you will, it will be posted. Thank you. I look forward to reading it over again. Yes, Representative Hooper. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Jen, again, always good to hear from you. You have uh, very good testimony every single time. Um, I'm curious, your list of eight will be on your testimony that you submit to yeah. Hornheiser and company. Um, I'm curious, what specifically in S13 needs to be removed? You know, I'd have to go back when I went through it, I went through each of the points and I took them and I shifted them to what it should say based on my perspective. So um, in terms of, I think, trying to redo a weighting formula, I believe if you read those appendices in Tammy Colby's report, it's pretty, it, it's pretty well done. And so re-looking at weighting is different than applying waiting and understanding how the money impacts and how that feeds into facilities needs. So to answer your question, what needs to be removed is the language of how it's looking at it so that we're not kicking the can down the road and doing the same work that's already been done, that we are taking it in, in full force, frontal um, implement, it, what implementation looks like. Okay, thank you. Representative Codman. Uh, thanks. I'm going to turn off my video because I have an unstable connection. Um, well, the same question we ask repeatedly here. Uh, you know, and with all due respect to my fellow school board members across the state, I've been a school board member for 15 years. Um, there's no guarantee that this money will be used for the, the, let me see, the extra taxing capacity will be used for its intended purpose to create equity. How do we how would you recommend that we um, assure that, that that school boards and school boards change over the years? Might, some might say, this is a great way for us to attract more people to our community by lowering our tax rates. Mm -hmm. Or we have spent enough in the past 10 years, we're going to keep our tax rates low and not put it to that. So how do we, how do we, what methods can we use to assure that that money is being used as intended or that taxing capacity is used as intended? 
So when I, in my recommendations, um, number two is there needs to be a specific connection and segue between student outcomes and the fiscal investments. And when you look at money that's coming into a district, how are people doing academically? And there's, a, there's research that shows that people love their community school. It doesn't matter if they're it's a super fantastic or it's really struggling. People love it because it's in the community and it's really important. We know what methods work to get children to learn math or literacy. You've been working on the literacy bill and it's very important that that's focused and detailed and that's how the money works. To answer your question, um, I, I just wanna hold up for you this, this little you know, flyer that we handed out that I think I brought to you that has you know, information about our schools. And prior to, you know, previously, that we weren't saying we have amazing schools, we care about education, education is important. And what would happen is you have small individual towns who are looking at their own tax rate and looking at how it's going to impact them. We have, a this year we had one town that couldn't pay its taxes and the taxes were due, I think October and they finally paid you know, later in the year and it's because of the number of high poverty folks. So what and i'm answering your question in a roundabout way how do you assure that people aren't just going to say hey lower the taxes great more money lower the taxes that's the vision and leadership of your school board and your um, ceo your your superintendent but it's also the requirements that the state has around we want quality schools and um you know prior to us merging school districts we had 186 school boards over the course of i think 15 school years that's a lot of different people. We are now able to have a bit more continuity and we have, we're able to take the time and to do a vision and strategic priority and base it on academic outcomes. So one, have specific requirements and then two, provide the leadership that allows for really quality education. And my, my, I have a board member who always says, look, I wasn't, I wasn't elected to a board to be a board member to lower your taxes, I was elected to provide the best quality education that a, a price our community can afford. And continuing to talk about quality education is how you do that. If I could follow up, do you think that the current educational quality standards um, system is strong enough to ensure that? The education quality standards, not necessarily. The combination of the education quality standards with our consolidated federal program data inventories and the data that's necessary, I think so, yes. You know, what Vermont has done though is adopted a bunch of different data collection systems over the years, you know, and, and now what's hard is when that changes and you're collecting data on math and then two years later, it's a different form of data and you can't look at it. So the EQS, the educational quality standards, are very general. It says you need one nurse per 500 children. It doesn't say we want to make sure all of our children are healthy and exercising and doing well on the fitness gram and knowing that they're improving their physical um, fitness. So those are the types of things that need to be required, and it's important for leaders to invest in that. Thank yeah, you, Representative, Representative Durfee. Thank you, uh, Chair Cooperly. And this, I'm asking you, Jen, this question because you were you were the witness at the moment. But uh, you may, you may not be the the person who has the answer. But to to, to the uh, to the argument that it's the intent that uh, that money that's freed up that that excess uh, capacity would free up to to spend on schools is is intended to be spent. Uh, rather than to lower tax rates. I, and I, I apologize because I think our committee may not have spent as much time so far digging into uh, to the waiting study. Uh, but is that, is that intent explicit somewhere either in the legislation that, uh, that created the waiting study or in possibly in the bill that we're looking at now? Uh, it, it, and I'm just not clear on that. So if I could just talk about that, you know, whether you agree or not with Act 46, what our community did is they looked at how is this going to improve education and educational outcomes 
and also how's it gonna change our tax rates? The conversation wasn't, we're gonna lower our taxes, that's why we should do this. It wasn't a one-sided conversation. And I believe the intent of the what I read from the document is to do both. You talk about, not, not do both, but look at the fiscal side, but then look at student performance side as well. You have, the two go hand in hand. Thanks, and I, I guess that's, I'm not sure that that I still know the answer to that question. And if anybody else cares to chime in, it doesn't have to be now, but that's a question that I've got. I will turn <clears throat> this over to Chair Webb. I was actually gonna let you keep going, but I, I, what I, I have a question about, I'm looking at current equalized pupil um, for Kingdom East. And I'm looking at, I'm not sure what the date is on this. I think it, it's for FY, if I get this for FY21, looking at the average equalized pupil spending would be uh, just a little bit under 17,000. And I'm noticing for you, it's 15,377, which is significantly below the average in spending. Um, and I'm just wondering, are you, are you putting forth budgets that are failing? I know that you've had trouble with, with any bonding, but are, are you finding that your budgets are failing? They have not failed in the last five years when we were unmerged. Uh, the Miller's Run, which it was a combined Sheffield Wheelock failed. Um, yeah, so our, our ed spending per equalized pupil of the budget that was just approved is 15,940. And the excess spending threshold is 18,311. So um, the, here's, here's the case though, is if you increase your ed spending per equalized pupil, what that does to the tax rate because of the throttle from Act 46 is it would make the taxes in one town go up 35, 40% and another town stay stable. And it's really challenging to have town A say, oh, wait a second, my taxes are going up this much. And so we have to, our board has worked really hard to calibrate those together. So you're not, it's not doing this. That's a technical term, this. <laughs> I understand those technical terms. Thank you. Um, Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, where are you on the screen? Oh, there you are, Jen. Um, you know, study after study that I've read and I, I, I trust is that the quality of the teacher, the caring, the skills, knowledge of the teacher is the most instrumental factor in advancing student learning. So um, how does student pupil ratio if, if you have 10 kids in a first grade and you have 23 kids in a first grade, how does that, how does that play into equity? So we adopted a class size policy and we are making our class sizes equitable so that someone in one school doesn't have 12 kids and someone in another school has 25. Your first question about the quality of the teacher, when you have, let me take Newark Street School, which has 65 students. They have a teacher who does K-1-2 and then a teacher who does three, four, five. And you know, a teacher has been there for 10 years. It can do the multi-age as high quality. When we have 20% turnover, yeah. the ability to um, develop those skills across grades in small rural schools is more challenging. And that's why you see class sizes in smaller schools, much smaller. And, you know, we, our, our board has worked really hard to have our class sizes be reasonable and not small and be within the guidelines of what the state has recommended. Um, did I answer your question? Kind of, you know, I always look at teachers' time as a resource. So, you know, if there's a certain amount of kids in, in, in a classroom it, and uh, what their learning styles, that student might take up more a ratio of their time, you know, attention. They can spend, you know, 10 minutes or five minutes talking to a student helping with literacy. But I think in a, a one to 10 ratio, they can spend more time. I mean, maybe I'm you know, I'm just curious about that, you know, in terms of uh, 
access, you know, to a teacher's time and their ability to help them. And how, again, how is it, how can we look at that in an equitable way? And, and so class size is one piece of the formula. Another piece of the formula is on the other side of class size, because if you have 14 children, you can have three or four different reading groups and children are able to push themselves or do um, theme related reading at different times. If there's only seven or eight kids, it's, that's very different and you don't have that peer support. In terms of you know, extra help, when you have, if you go, I've spent a fair amount of time at Columbia Teachers College at their summer rating and writing institute, and they'll have classes of 25 kids, and they have it really dialed in in terms of kids working independently, kids working in small groups, getting support that's pushed in by a special educator or by an interventionist, and the 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 extra help, the model that we think of as standing in the front of the room, oh, those three kids don't know it, they need extra help, is very different from really understanding where children are and what their next moves are, and then grouping and supporting that embedded in the classroom. And that's where the 20% attrition comes in, is because that takes training. We spend a lot of money training our faculty and staff. And then when they get trained, and then they leave, and they go to um, Middlebury or Harwood, or um, cross at Brook, then you know we've done the great training and off they go and we start over again, so. Yeah, great, thank you. It's always really a pleasure to hear from you. Okay. I am checking to see if I believe we might be finished uh, for now. Uh, I know we have, I believe we've got Mans Mount Mansfield um, coming in tomorrow to speak to this bill as well. Um, I am going to reach out to the Agency of Education to get a little bit more clarity on the EQS and how it uh, factors into the report here to the, to the currently S13. And then we'll be looking to uh, see if we can sort this into two, two lines, the immediate specific questions related to uh, S13 waiting implementation and the other questions that we are addressing that are also relevant to the topic at hand on education funding. So that would be my, my goal, um, checking with um, Representative Ansel to see if she has any other, anything that she wants to add. No, uh, well, I, I do. I want to thank you for uh, and inviting us to join you. And um, I, I understand you're taking testimony tomorrow as well. I'm not sure whether uh, what our schedule will be in the morning, but if we, if you continue to extend the invitation, um, I will let you know if we're going to show up. Um, depending, we've got a one or two other bills that we've got to deal with in our committee. But, um, but I really appreciate um, being. We appreciate the addition of the questions from your district as well. Um, yes, I see that right now we only have one other district. Uh, I, I want to check to see um, with the superintendents and school boards if they have one, one more uh, that might want to also speak. And I think we will then um, probably we've got information. We'll have information from the field that will help us guide what we're going to be doing. Okay, I think I see no other questions and I wanna thank everybody and I think that we can end and end.